exhibit. So with Pan American, they, you know, Pan American's history in Hawaii is pretty extensive from 1935 up until 1991 when they flew their first and then last flight out. Pan Am has had a, a great presence in Hawaii. They are responsible probably for uh, air travel to Hawaii and for tourism as we know it today. So they decided to do <laughs> a Pan Am exhibit. Hi. It's such a big point of aviation in Hawaii. So I was pleased to have uh, them ask me for a couple of things. So the Pan Am's captain hat. That captain hat is. Uh, it belonged to a gentleman who actually flew on a Pan American Clipper on the morning of December 7th, 1941. They actually diverted to Hilo. They were supposed to land in, Hawaii, in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, but they stopped en route and landed in Hilo, stayed there for, I think, about three or four days, painted over the aircraft into gray and camouflage colors, and flew back to California to get out of Hawaii. Wow. So that's his hat from his final years of Pan American, and this is his retirement wings. Wow. So he uh, received that in a, encased in acrylic, and that was like a, a memento that he had. So he was actually based out of uh, Los Angeles when he retired. He's since passed away, but I was able to uh, acquire that through uh, various sources to my Pan Am collection, and the Pacific Aviation Museum says, hey, you got some Pan Am stuff? I said, yes, I do. Wow, that's let me, pretty cool. Uh, let me loan it to you, and there it is, proudly on display, his final captain's hat, and then his retirement wings with Pan American World Airways. Did they pay you? Nope. So you, know, you know, you donate things to museums. <laughs> it's on loan. Yeah. It's on, on loan. Lo oh, okay, okay, okay. No, no, cool. no extended dates. <laughs> okay, we're here at the Pacific Aviation Museum, and we got we got the grand tour from the Dolson. <laughs> Nick, the Dolson. Well, I'm, I'm not, not officially part of the Pacific Avi Aviation Museum, but certainly a, a, a proud supporter of Pacific Aviation. Uh, if you follow at Hawaii Aviation, you'll see a lot of our content there, and if you follow at Fly Pan Am, that's me and my group of friends. All so right, very that. good. All on Twitter. The best part of the collection, though, is these little cocktail glasses. Those are pretty neat. So on first class service, um, you would have a wine glass, a aperitif, a little cognac glass, a little rock glass, and of course a, a little beer glass. Where's the, where's, the, where's the Pan Am Bay? The Pan Am notorious or infamous Pan Am Bay, Bay right? They well, they've fall. got some small rep representations right. here. Every high schooler in the 70s had one. <laughs> you know, as, as, a, as a proud supporter and a collector of Pan Am, I had never owned a Pan Am bag when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, because it was not a thing to have when you were a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so now you're you bringing buy, them back. Now you back. can buy replicas, and I actually own a few replicas myself. This is on Ford Island, so we're on Ford Island at the Pacific Aviation Museum. And of course, we're looking at the, all the Pan Am memorabilia. Miss Katie. Oh, okay. What are we moving? Are we moving? <laughs> yeah. So the original uh, Pan Am Clippers that flew into Hawaii uh -huh. was the, uh, the Sikorsky S42, followed by the Martin M130, 1935, and that's actually the Philippine Clipper. It's a great photograph. Wow. And then, of course, the. In the 1939 and 1940 era, before the war, the Boeing 314 Clipper. In fact, that 314 Clipper was the aircraft that was en route to Honolulu from California uh, when it diverted into Hilo. Right. In fact, there were several aircraft that were on their way to Hawaii, but needless to say, because of the attack of, uh, at Pearl Harbor, they did not uh, continue on with their journey. So, do, never... um, do any of the Clippers actually still operate? Are they, you know, in, in operating condition? None of these aircraft that Pan American had mm -hmm. are in existence today. Oh, uh -huh. not a one. Oh, and it's a, it's really a tragic shame that not one is in existence. The Philippine Clipper right up here actually crashed in 1943, I believe, mm -hmm. in California. Uh, it was flying from Honolulu, got lost in the clouds and fog, and crashed in California, killing all aboard. It was a very tragic thing. I could see the flaw with that. Over here is uh, the founder of Pan American, mm -hmm. Juan Terry Tripp. Charles Lindbergh had a great uh, uh, influence with Pan American. He was hired by Pan Am as a, uh, a consultant. 
and he uh, actually flew a lot of pioneering flights with Pan Am. Right here is the famous Captain Edwin Music. He was the first commercial airline pilot to fly to Hawaii, and he. Um, hey man, I love those hearts. Thanks for the hearts. <laughs> must be, and he flew must be the in to Honolulu, and uh, he was the first uh, pilot. He was Pan American's chief pilot, and he was uh, the first guy to fly in Hawaii with his crew. First commercial airline flight. Very Sadly, cool. in 1938, he perished aboard the Samoan Clipper that flew from here down to. Uh, Auckland, New Zealand, but on the way to Auckland, he crashed uh, outside of Samoa. Yeah. And, uh, his crew, along with uh, Captain Music himself, perished in the flight. So he's pretty famous amongst aviators. He was like the most prominent flyer of his day. Uh, if he had lived, you would probably still know him as a famous pilot, mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. to the likes of Lindbergh and so mm -hmm. forth. But he, he perished and subsequently sort of became lost in history, but because a lot of historians come up and uh, see his contribution to aviation, he is a well-known figure. He was called Meticulous Music. He was a very meticulous pilot. The fact that he died in an accident uh, was beyond belief at the time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Did he find out what happened to the aircraft? Or was it what what happened was they were uh, they had an engine problem. They dumped fuel. And the fuel in flight got sucked back into the wing and subsequently into the engine and ignited. Oh, wow! So he, uh, um, it wasn't his fault, it was a design flaw in the aircraft. And uh, it wasn't a good thing when Pan American and certainly Juan Trip, the founder of Pan Am, found out about his death, they were all devastated. Because he was uh, Pan American's. Premier pilot. If anybody would survive the age of the golden age of aviation, yeah, no kidding. What a story! But unfortunately, he did not. He is actually also on Twitter, believe it or not. At I think it's at Captain Music, and and, and, and he's actually tweets tweeting. about his. Well, he doesn't tweet about his life, but somebody tweets about his life. Oh, wow. it's, it's kind of an, it's kind of an interesting account. At Captain Music. So this is actually the aircraft that he was flying at the time. Oh. That's a Sikorsky S42. And, um, well, it's good that you know that 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 devastating end to his career didn't end Pan Am. Right. Because I mean, I mean, it could have it because could they have, were right. exploring routes across the Pacific, and um, it was important to have those pioneering routes to prove that the flights could fly that far right, and get right. to the locations that they were going. To. In this case, it was Auckland, New Zealand. So, yeah, he was flying this airplane. No kidding, you gotta think the pilot. Uh, developed an engine problem, as I said. Fuel got into the wings through the flap area uh -huh. and ignited a new aircraft outside of Ponga Ponga. Somewhere. And is the reason why the wing is orange? Like, was the aircraft filled with enough weight so that they were replicating a full flight? Is that how they determined the distance? Well, yeah, the flight had full fuel. It didn't have any passengers on it. It just had a crew of seven or eight. But the reason the color is like that, it's kind of like an international orange, and most of the civilian aircraft at that time. Well, let's see that. Let's see what this guy Aaron is doing. <laughs> He's loving somebody really, really hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, that's who, who you who you Who are you? You. Are you getting the heart? Oh, you're getting him. Oh, I know. Oh, there they are. Okay. Are you still hearting? <laughs> okay. Take us inside. Oh, so we're going to go inside. Um, I think one of my most favorite airplanes, probably, that the museum has. It's really kind of a gem uh -huh. that there are only, I think, about seven or eight or ten museums in the entire world that have an aircraft like this. And it's historic for Hawaii and certainly here at Pearl Harbor because it is, in fact, the Japanese Mitsubishi Zoo. Uh -huh. uh -huh. This aircraft, from what I understand, is still technically flyable. Wow. I mean, it looks this, like it's pretty yeah. good shape. Yeah, it is. This Zero, uh, it's actually a Nakajima built uh, Mitsubishi Zero. It's built by Nakajima on the license because they wanted to produce so many Zeros. Mm -hmm. And uh, this representation right here is uh, an aircraft that I think the museum acquired it after it was found in, I think, New Guinea. You can come over here real quick. 
So when they found it in New Guinea, was it had already crashed or something? Yeah, or? It, it, it was in a state of disrepair, uh -huh. and uh, the museum acquired it uh, through several sources after it had been found, obviously found and then renovated. But this particular aircraft was depicted as uh, Shigenori Nishikaichi's aircraft that flew over Pearl Harbor off the carrier Kiryu of the Imperial Japanese Navy. So. That supposedly is a representation of him on board the Hiryu in the diorama that you see behind, mm -hmm. supposedly on an aircraft carrier. So he flew off of uh, the Hiryu, flew over Pearl Harbor. Uh, the aircraft was uh, shot at and, and had damage. And it, he eventually crash landed on the island of Nihau. Oh, wow. So he was uh, on Nihau and was uh, not captured initially, but was kind of helped by some of the islanders there. But uh, a gentleman by the name of Ben Kanahele, uh, Hawaiian, full-blooded Hawaiian, I mean, uh, captured him, and they knew the significance of, uh, they didn't know what happened at Pearl Harbor, but they found out through radio that, hey, something bad had happened, and that uh, uh, we need to hold this guy. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, captured, and there was, I guess you could say a collaborator on the island who was of Japanese ancestry who wanted to help him. And the, he, along with uh, Nishikaichi, were eventually killed because he had shot at Kanahele and, and shot him. Oh, yeah? And uh, if you walk over here, uh -huh. you'll see... I mean, what, what prompted death? Confrontation. Well, well, obviously the United States was at war with Japan. Right. He was now an enemy. And, uh, so somebody told Kanhele, this guy's hey, an enemy? Hey, this guy's an enemy and we need to hold him and he tried to escape uh, and that subsequently caused uh, uh, his death. It's, it called the battle of, it's called the Battle of Nihau. So if you walk over here, you will actually see the remnants of Nishikaichi's aircraft that was recovered off of Nihau. Okay, now we're getting a tour, we're getting a grand tour from uh, Nick Augusta, who's a historian. So the whole battle was called the Nihau Zero Incident. And as you can see, the, wreck the wreckage of the Mitsubishi Zero uh -huh. uh, was recovered. And this is the remnants of what was recovered. Ah. So uh, Nishikaichi had apparently uh, documents on board his aircraft, maps, plans of the attack and he wanted to make sure that those didn't fall into U.S. hands. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the reasons why, as you can see here, uh, a gentleman by the name of Yoshio Harada, who was a Japanese uh, resident of Nihau, uh, aided the pilot, aided Nishikaichi. But uh, as I said, uh, Benik Kanahele mm -hmm. and his wife uh, eventually overpowered and killed him. Mm -hmm. And then Harada actually committed suicide. So here's a picture of Nishikaichi. Here's a picture of Parada, and here's a picture of uh, Kanahele, who was awarded a medal uh, later in the war for his actions. Wow. And of course, so there was that's a the Japanese remnant. guy actually living on me, huh? Yeah, he was a caretaker on the island, oh. and uh, he, he, I guess you could say, just sided with him and said, hey, you know, here's a fellow countryman of yeah. one time, yeah. and he wanted to help him, and he didn't know of the attack on Pearl Harbor, but mm -hmm. he eventually found out through what he mm -hmm. um, Nishikaichi uh, told them and said, hey, we need to protect you know, the documents in my aircraft. And uh, yeah, I mean, just, it's just one of those things where you get caught up in history and you take the wrong side. And, and he took the wrong side. And he was eventually killed and Harada committed suicide. And uh, that's the Lee well, Harada Zero incident. He committed suicide yeah. because uh, what, he felt a disgrace yes. for having kind of turned his countrymen in or something? Apparently, something like that. Oh. Yeah, so Kanaheli was shot uh, in the lower abdomen and leg, and he was in serious condition, but he survived. And uh, uh, from the legend, the story goes that he killed Harada by throwing him against a stone wall. <laughs> and he essentially killed him with his bare hands. <laughs> wait, wait, so, so who committed suicide? Harada. Harada committed suicide. Harada who helped Nishikaichi. Kanaheli killed So who threw who against the wall? Harada, oh. Kind of heli tree. Yeah. Ah. Through the pilot against the wall. <laughs> after, ah. be, after being shot. Ah. <laughs> ah. 
What a drama. Yeah. Wow. It was uh, it was a very uh, very insane week on Mihao between December 7th and 13th when all this transpired. Wow. And no one knew about it until after it happened. So that's the aircraft. So these are actual these are actual you know, sort of re remains of the, the aircraft that crashed, right? This is part of the engine cylinder right here, and then part of the wings. Nothing else is left. Surprised that, uh, you know, he got out alive. Yeah. Well, you can see back in this photograph how the aircraft crashed and uh -huh. eventually burned. Uh huh. So oh, not, I see. not much was left. So. Wow. All right, so you got it here. So this is the Pacific Aviation Museum. Quite a, quite a few historic pieces, for sure. Another thing about the attack on the wall, okay, this is aircraft right here, uh -huh. what was that? was actually in the air. It was a civilian aircraft. It was in the air at the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was flown by a gentleman by the name of Vitusek. And uh, he and his son were on board. Uh, they eventually landed back at Honolulu uh, Airport, which mm -hmm. is today Honolulu International, mm -hmm. and they survived. They were they were so they kind of just what but flew through the air while yeah, the attack they was were, taking place. They were airborne on the morning of December seventh, doing a just a normal Sunday morning flight, uh -huh. and uh, they found themselves. And this is the actual this is the actual plane. That's the actual plane. Yeah, they, wow. they found themselves surrounded by uh, attacking Japanese zeros. Japanese Zeros, Kates, Dow dive bombers, the whole nine yards. They were very fortunate to make it make it down safely. What about this guy right here? That's a P-40. And this aircraft is actually a, a model of a P-40. Uh -huh. And this model was built for the uh, movie Toro Toro Toro. And this is to scale? It's to scale. It's not a, a real P, P, it's not a real P, P40. It's a uh, a model that was used for the movie Tora 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 in 1969 when they filmed here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fun stuff. Yeah. B25. This replicates uh, the B25 that flew off of the USS Hornet in 1942 of April. Yeah, they were the first aircraft to bomb Japan. <laughs> hey, Aaron. Thanks for the hearts. Oh, no problem. <laughs> no, it's a great tour. It's a good tour. Yeah, no, no. Guided tour. So, and so where, where did this guy come from? I mean, was this part of the, uh, well, the it's battle? To, or? Yeah, it's supposed to represent the, the Doolittle Raid. So after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, the U.S. was kind of frustrated, right? Because they mm -hmm. wanted to, to make a, a significant uh, strike back at Japan. And they planned to fly uh, uh, so many B-25s off of uh, the USS Horn. I think it was 16. Flew off the carrier, bombed Japan, and then eventually flew beyond Japan and landed in China. Some of them crashed, some of them were killed, and some of them were captured. Mm -hmm. But General Doolittle was the leader of this uh, of this operation, and he went on to fight. And, uh, Why, did they did just have well enough fuel to do a one-way one trip? One-way trip. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, the thought at the time was, this is a one-way mission, and in all likelihood, we would not survive. So, so, uh, what, the U.S. had kamikaze too? Well, the plan was to fly over Japan and then land in China, and then meet up with oh, friendly, Chinese, I meet got up with friendly Chinese forces, I but they didn't have any idea what the air defenses were in uh, Japan, and whether or not they would even make it back home. And uh, it was all volunteers, they will go. First time a light a bomber like this ever flew off a carrier, they practiced it, and uh, they were able to do it. So how many, how many planes in that flight? I think it was 16. Wow. Yep, April 18th, 1942. You know what, uh, what carrier? The carrier? USS Hornet. Hornet. Yep, you see, this is Doolittle's aircraft as it flew off, and this is uh, the aircraft on the fantail of the carrier. Uh -huh. Absolutely incredible feat. And where do they drop most of their... Uh... In and around Tokyo and several other cities. Um, the damage was light, but you can understand the psychological impact mm -hmm. of uh, an attack on the homeland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the Japanese military says, there's no way that the U.S. will ever bomb us. 
six months later after an attack on Pearl Harbor, boom, they, they dropped bombs on Japan. So it was the beginning of uh, many bombs to mm -hmm. land on the, mm -hmm. on the Japanese mainland. And as you know, we just celebrated the 70th, well, I don't, you know, not celebrated, but really remembered the 70th, 70th anniversary of the, the ending of the, the war with Japan. And uh, a lot of lives were lost by U.S. bombers in Japan, a lot of civilian lives, but, you know, the nature of war is such that, you know, you have to be in it to win it. And uh, the United States, through its power and might, ended it. Mm -hmm. you know, some say today you know, there's a lot of controversy about should the United States have dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There are people who say, you know, they shouldn't have used a mass destruction weapon like that. But think of the lives that would have been lost on both sides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if the United States was to invade Japan. It abruptly ended the war and ended it. And now Japan is maybe outside of Britain, probably our strongest ally. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. you think about that, Seven years later, it's a good thing, right? So now we're uh, no longer enemies, but very, very strong now. Very strong friends. The, the use of the bomb was kind of political, where if they didn't use it, they sent troops in, many troops died, well, and they had a the, weapon the, that would have yeah, saved. Yeah, exactly. So the invasion of Japan, they anticipated there would be a million casualties, both U.S. and Japanese. And that's an astronomical figure when you think about it. So when you compare that to the lives, the unfortunate lives, the civilian lives that were lost in Japan, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, all life is precious. You know, war is a tough thing. You gotta weigh it out. And the United States and General or, uh, President Truman made the decision, look, we need to end this, and this, this weapon that we have is likely to end it. And, uh, you know, History will be the judge now and into the future, but it ended the war, and Japan is our friend and ally. Yeah, so. Yep, yep. Well. Okay, what do we got on this side? Further down here, we've got uh, SPD Dauntless, which was the uh, type of aircraft that flew at the Battle of Midway. And really, it's kind of a turning point in uh -huh. the Pacific because the U.S. was able to destroy several Japanese carriers and really turn the tide of war in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. The Imperial Navy was never the same after the Battle of Midway. And this was one of the aircraft that, that flew off of several U.S. carriers, including the York Yorktown and Lexington, and, and destroyed four of the Japanese mainline carriers and sunk them. So that's an SPD Dauntless. Over here we have a, a Grumman Wildcat. This aircraft served in the South Pacific. Flew off of islands uh, such as Guadalcanal, Tarawa. This guy looks like it's in pretty good, uh, pretty good condition. Yeah. So early part of the war, and this is another gem that the Pacific Aviation Museum has. They've got a phenomenal collection here, and this Wildcat is one of them. So. This Wildcat uh, flew out of Henderson Field in Guadalcanal and uh, helped support the, you know, the, the island hopping invasion that the United States uh, strategically had mm -hmm. to make sure that you know, we get to Japan one island at a time. So it's part of the, what they call the Cactus Air Force. Pretty, pretty. Cactus, uh, referring to? You know, I never quite understood why they call it the Cactus Air Force, but they did. Um, <laughs> so the historical impact, obviously, is uh, you know, after the Battle of Midway, mm -hmm. and I think they just, uh, according to this, the, the Henderson Spiel code name is Cactus, so that provided a nickname for the aviator, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Cactus Air Force flying out of Henderson Field, so that, that's the reason. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, no. And then the last aircraft, uh, this short little tour, is the, okay, yes. it's the Boeing Stearman. And that was actually flown by this individual who happened to become president of the United States. Ah. So he actually did his flight training in this aircraft. And if you come right over here,
so it's a Stearman N2S3. So the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Army Air Force, they would train in this aircraft before they received their wings. And President George Herbert Walker Bush flew this same airplane, the exact same airplane, on his training flights. So you can imagine President Bush, as a young 18, 19-year-old aviator, sitting in the front seat, his instructor in the back seat. And he flew this one, 103. He flew 103, yeah. So he actually flew off the USS San Jacinto in World War II and flew off that carrier in a Grumman TBM Avenger, a three-crewman torpedo bomber. He was actually shot down in that aircraft near one of the islands in the South Pacific. He was the only one to survive out of his crew. He was rescued by a U.S. submarine and then brought aboard and subsequently survived the war. Wow. He was extremely lucky. So this aircraft was named the Yellow Peril. I think it was named the Yellow Peril by flight instructors because you never knew what the student would do aboard this aircraft. So, yeah, it was very perilous. Risky. Very risky, yeah. All right. That's the Boeing Stearman. Thank you, Nick. All right, my pleasure. Thank you. Great tour. Thank you, Bert. Always a pleasure to meet up with you and share a little bit of Hawaii. No, you are the historian. At least aviation in Hawaii. Yeah, that's great. Try to be. All right, mahalo, Bert. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, guys, this is the Pacific Aviation Museum. So if you're ever uh, out here on Ford Island, come visit the uh, museum here and you can see all the planes that we just gave you a tour of. We're going to be uh, heading back outside and get under that tent and maybe have another cool one before we head on out of here. But uh, thanks for joining me and I guess I'll see you on the next uh, Periscope. Anyway, have a great Sunday and uh, take care. Catch you later. Aloha.